All right, well, welcome to Jackson Community Church. It's the middle of February. It's the beginning of February vacation for several school systems, certainly in Massachusetts, and a very busy week in the Valley for uh, the hospitality industry who receives all those visitors this week. So a lot of extra jobs, many extra meals and ski touring lessons and all kinds of things for and beds to be made and laundry to be done to welcome guests this week so consequently it can be somewhat quiet here but we um, welcome all of you who are able to be with us on this president's day weekend sunday and for the life of the church the main announcement that I have at the moment is that next Monday, so February 28th, which is two days before the beginning of Lent, believe it or not, Lent is coming right up soon, we will have a Mardi Gras celebration here at the church. It'll start at 630. And DeMarco Alvarez is the pianist who will be playing for us. He'll be playing jazz. And you are all welcome to come, bring friends, and enjoy some music together right before we start Lent. And then you can watch for a full Lenten schedule to be put out. I will certainly be doing Ashes throughout Ash Wednesday, which will be March 2nd in a week and a half. And there will be Lenten devotionals available and all kinds of programming coming up. So as we continue our discussions of journey, we are preparing to enter our Lenten season together. Are there other announcements for the life of the church that I missed that anybody wants to make either in Zoom or here in the sanctuary? Okay, no announcement. In that case, I'm going to ask us to really arrive here in this space gather yourself put your feet on the floor we're going to invite alan to play centering music for us so please relax your bodies maybe place your hands openly in your lap just to receive the gifts that are offered here today close your eyes if you choose and breathe And let's just take a moment to once more appreciate the gift of Alan's music while we are able to share it with him and appreciate all that you contribute to the richness of our worship experience, Alan. Thank you. Our call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 121. You'll find it either on the screen if you're in Zoom or you'll find it in your bulletin. We lift up our eyes to the mountains. Where does our help come from? God will not let our feet slip. The Lord watches over us, our shade and shelter, so the sun will not harm us by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep us from harm and watch over our lives. The Lord will watch over our coming in and our going out. 
both now and forevermore. And of course, we begin each service by sharing our prayers, those of concern and those of celebration. And so we'll start here in the sanctuary today. And if there is anyone who wants to lift up a prayer of concern, please raise your hand. Sue has the microphone and we'll ask you to speak into the microphone if there is a prayer of concern. Alan has one. Sue's walking around, so there's like travel time involved here. I'd like to uh, pray for the people of the Ukraine. Um, I have uh, some friends that are originally from Ukraine, so uh, I obviously want to hold them in my prayers, uh, but that whole region in particular. Prayers for the Ukraine, for the tensions between Russia and the Ukraine, and the way the world is paying attention and trying to use diplomacy to avoid military conflict. We pray for wisdom and moderation by world leaders. Other prayers of concern here in the sanctuary that you wish to lift up out loud? I'm going to turn to Zoom and ask if there are any prayers in Zoom that are prayers of concern. I see Judy has her hand raised. If you want to unmute, Judy. Yes, I'd like prayers for our, our very close friend, Arthur Dusso in Portland. He has cancer and they've only given him three more months. Uh, so prayers for Arthur and Donna. Prayers for Arthur and Donna. Mm -hmm. And Arthur's living with cancer. Right. Other prayers of concern in Zoom. Sandy, go ahead. Uh, prayers for Charlie, um, a friend of mine's uh, dad who is um, now at home but not doing well at all. We we feel that he is on his final journey. So prayers for that family. So prayers for Charlie and his family as he's home on a on a challenging part of his life, perhaps saying goodbye. Other prayers of concern that people wish to raise up out loud. Then let me add to these prayers of concern, those that we lift up every week and those that were raised up this morning at eight o'clock. The names that were raised up between eight o'clock and this morning are for Jean, Brenda, Christine, for two people who died, my grandmother, Carmel, who passed this week, and for an, the aunt of our church moderator, and her aunt's name was Mavis Davis. And it's worth smiling about because she smiled when her husband asked her to marry her when she knew she would have a rhyming last name, Mavis Davis. We pray for Anjali, and for Dottie, for the healing of their bones following ski accidents. They are both leaders in our community who help us with our well being. We pray for Birdie and her ongoing recovery. We pray for Bob Kendall and his hip following a fall. We pray for Scamp, for Huntley, for Sasha and her granddaughter Mary, for Sandra and Richard for Alice, for Anne, for Jan and Barry, for Joyce and Richard, and for Arden and Ray. And I think we should always throw in Doc Gilmore's heart. He could, he could use attention for his heart. We also pray for those that we are saying goodbye to. Um, Megan Kate's father is on hospice. Ray is on hospice. We pray for Kevin, um, a member of our community who struggles with mental health and he's in another state, not safe. And he communicates with us regularly. We don't know how long that will last. 
And so he's beyond our reach except by way of prayer. And so for our ongoing prayer for Kevin, um, who has shown us the light on the struggles that people have and yet the ways that they can contribute so richly to our community, let us hold him in the light. We lift up also prayers of joy and celebration. And Jean Melchizarek asked that we give prayers of celebration for the cardinals on her deck. Bird sightings always are a good thing. So, and uh, Mary Dindorf this morning reported seeing a bald eagle. So also pretty cool over in her place in Maine. And I want to say that this journey that I took this week with my family going back to Western Pennsylvania included a chance for four siblings to be in the same room together for the first time in four decades. I got to meet grand nieces that I had not yet met who were born in the past year. So for Stella and Riley, the new additions to our family and the joy that babies can bring into any kind of situation. Uh, gratitude for new life and returning life and persistent, resilient life in the face of all kinds of challenges. And now I invite your prayers of celebration. What are you happy about this week? What gives you joy and pause to give thanks? We would love to hear from you. Let's, we're going to start in the sanctuary, and I've got both Lori and Alan have their hands raised, and Meg. I just want to say thank you to the weather, <laughs> the weather, <laughs> and I'm not talking the cold weather. The other day when we had 45 or 50 degrees, I felt I was born again. I had forgotten what it was like to walk out and it was warm. And so I'm very excited about spring. Okay. So for, for sneak previews of spring, Lori gives thanks. Um, I just want to um, say I'm very grateful that uh, I moved to a new home and I'm a homeowner again. So I'm very, very grateful. For that. That's wonderful, Alan. And Meg had her hand up. I'm happy that uh, I'm holding the hand up that I had operated on several weeks ago. And I'm very happy that I'm back to knitting and sewing mittens and uh, snowshoeing and I'm wow. going to try skiing today. So really happy. That's great. That's an outstanding use of those, that hand. Thank you. We thank you. Anybody else here in the sanctuary have any thanks they want to add to the mix? Then we turn to Zoom. Anybody in Zoom have a prayer of gratitude that you wish to lift up? Sandy has a prayer of gratitude. Go ahead, Sandy. Uh, grateful to spend my mom uh, spend my mom's birthday with her yesterday uh, and my sister and her husband. Um, we had a great day and a lot of laughs. Nice. So for Sandy's mom's birthday and family gatherings. Okay, I'm afraid that they are frozen. Which I think. I think Arden and uh, Bob and Kip, but Arden, you're muted. How about that? There we go. Better. Okay. Um, my daughter, Allison, um, from New York, has come up to stay with us for a week. And uh, Ray is uh, uh, responding well to and trying to get uh, used to being bedridden. Um, it's, it, you know, when you have to do everything with him in the bed, it's, it's hard. Allison, Laura, and I are um, becoming experts, <laughs> along with help from the wonderful people at hospice. So just very grateful that Allison is up for a week. And Sandy, if you see other people that have their hands raised, because my, my connection's freezing in and out, so I'm going to have to rely on you. Yep, Bob and Kit. I just wanted to say how nice it is to be able to be with you, even though we're in Florida right now, and to be able to hear about your lives and what's going on. I miss you all. Are you going to tell us how warm it is down there, Kit? 
I, I don't want to make you jealous. <laughs> it, it, it's going to be 75 today, so it's oh. just perfect. 75. That might be that might be too much of a shock. I'm not sure we could take it that fast, but 75 <laughs> degrees. OK, you enjoy it for us. I am. I'll send some to you. <laughs> <laughs> and Sandy, was there someone else that had a prayer? Uh, no, I, I think that's it. All right. We also want to include in our prayers our partner church, the Chikanga Church in the city of Mutare in the nation of Zimbabwe. We will be working with them to support their project to finish their roof this year, or at least the trusses on their roof. I think they only have one more to go, and then they can begin putting the roofing on. And so as they continue their work to top off their church, we, we pray with them. And in the coming weeks, you'll be hearing more about how we will be partnering with them to help with this final push. I don't think it's finalized yet, is it, Jeanette? I do have a figure. Um, it's pretty large and I don't expect we'll raise, I don't think we're gonna try to raise all of it, but um, yeah, we do have a figure. Are, is mission team ready to talk about it or do you guys want to work? I think we'll be putting together something a little bit more formal so that we inform okay. people exactly what's going on. Thank you. Great. And how they can help. Perfect. We pray also for the villages in Honduras with whom we have been connected. And, you know, it's probably going to be a while before anybody's going to be able to get back there. But um, Meg has a quick update, I think. So if you do, then I, I want you to just say it into the microphone, though, Meg, okay? Right into the microphone. Yes, I forgot to say it before, but um, a mission team is going again. It's been two years since I went and since anyone was able to go. But they're going March 1st to the 10th. Uh, Bill Briggs, the coordinator, and his wife, Susie, and two more people are going. And there's been great progress on education and the roads and the water system. So um, we should have wonderful news when, we, when they get back. But March 1st to 10th, they're traveling to San Jose and Plan Grande, the two villages. San Jose and Plan Grande. And hope we'll, have, we'll look forward to the updates following um, the vision. I mean, the mission teams visit there. Then I'm going to ask that you pray with me. Oh, holy God, we are your children. And as the Psalm says, we place our lives into your keeping, our going in and our coming out and all the journey between those points of departure and return great homecoming to which our lives lead us. And yet we have a home here in this world, uh, in our families, in our communities, among our friends. And so we give thanks for your presence and your love here where we live now in this mortal life. With gratitude, we honor those who have gone before us, including Mavis Davis and Carmel Kiefer. We honor the lives of those who are still with us, but who are sharing with us the final parts of their journeys, who teach us even now what it means to be human and to be close to the divine and to be wrapped up in love and how to love someone through the hardest parts as well as the easiest part. We give thanks for new life, for infants, for young children who help teach us in different ways to look at the world anew who remind us that we are caregivers and stewards of a world that we hope to pass down to future generations. We give thanks for cardinals and bald eagles and tastes of spring and wonderful different places where the seasons are even hotter than ours are and the chance to dance in the snow for the first time if you've never experienced it like one of my nieces did this week. We ask that you will hold the places in the world that are so vulnerable and so at risk right now, including Russia and the Ukraine and the risk of 
armed conflict there and in other parts of the world, that you will help those leaders find a path and all other world leaders, all other governments in the ways that they are able to support solutions that avoid armed conflict. And we ask to be inspired by our Olympic athletes to understand that we can be different and yet have gifts that we can put to common use and celebrate each other even when we compete. In all things, we give thanks for your love and your presence. And we ask that where we are empty, you will fill us until we are overflowing with joy, with hope, with love, with gratitude. And it spills out of us and shines through us into the lives of others. We offer you now our silence. And we lift up our voices together and I ask that those who are in Zoom, if you are able, please unmute so that you can join us as we say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, Our Father who art in heaven, art in heaven hallowed, be, hallowed thy be thy name. Thy kingdom, thy kingdom come, come, thy will, thy will be, done be done on earth, on earth as, as it is in heaven. heaven. Give us this day, us this our, day daily our daily bread. bread. And forgive us our forgive sins, our sins as, we forgive as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us, deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, thine is the kingdom the, power, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. And now let's join together singing, Won't You Let Me Be Your Servant? You will find that song on page 3. 74 in the red pew hymnal. And you'll also see those lyrics up on your screen if you are in Zoom. We will sing all five verses today. Please rise if you're able. Please be seated. And Sue, are you our reader today? Are you? Great. A reading from Luke, chapter 7, verse 1 through 23. 
Jesus heals a centurion's servant. After Jesus had finished all his sayings in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. A centurion there had a slave whom he valued highly and who was ill and close to death. When he heard about Jesus, he sent some Jewish elders to him, asking him to come and heal his slave. When they came to Jesus, they appealed to him earnestly, saying, "When, saying, he is worthy of having you do this for him, for he loves our people, and it is he who built our synagogue for us. And Jesus went to them, and when he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying, saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Therefore, I did not presume to come to you, but only speak the word and let my servant be healed. For I also am a man set under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes. And to another, come, and he comes. And to my slave, do this, and the slave does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. And turning to the crowd that followed him, he said, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. When those who have been sent returned to the house, they found the slave in good health. Jesus raises the widow's son at Nain. Soon afterwards, he went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd went with him. As he approached the gate of the town, a man who had died was being carried out. He was his mother's only son, and she was a widow. And with her was a large crowd from the town. When the Lord saw her, he had compassion for her and said to her, Do not weep. Then he came forward and touched the, the bier, and the bearers stood still. And he said, Young man, I say to you, rise. The dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him to his mother. Fear seized all of them, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has risen among us, and God has looked favorably on his people. This word about him spread throughout Judea, and all the surrounding country. Uh, there is one final reading. I'm going to just add that in. The messengers from John the Baptist. It's okay. I'll do it, Sue. It's okay. Um, the disciples of John reported all these things to him. They reported about the healing of the centurion servants, and they reported about the raising of the widow's son in Nain. John summoned two of his disciples and sent them to the Lord to ask, are you the one who is to come or are we to wait for another? And when the men had come to him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you to ask, are you the one who is to come or are we to wait for another? Jesus had just then cured many people of diseases, plagues, and evil spirits and had given sight to many who were blind. And he answered them, go and tell John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor have good news brought to them, and blessed is anyone who takes no offense at me. So ends the reading. Thank you, Sue. Uh, in case anybody doesn't know, I, um, I was preparing for uh, worship this week and my grandmother died and so I spent my weekend driving to western Pennsylvania for a funeral and a family gathering and then just really returned this morning uh, so 
if you see inconsistencies in the bulletin, it's all me all the time. The new members joined last week. Nobody in, the, in Zoom, you guys didn't see this, but the bulletin says we're welcoming new members again this week. And I think it has other references that are not correct. So we're going to go straight to the sermon. And I want to say first that, you know, one of the lines of Psalm 121 is, is a bit of a challenge for us to swallow. It says the Lord will keep us from harm and watch over our lives. And yet I want to uh, raise your hand if you have never experienced harm in your life. Is there anybody here who can raise their hand or anybody in Zoom who feels that they've experienced no harm ever anywhere? Nobody that I can see is raising their hands. And so I think we have to think more largely and generously about even what the psalm writer means when the psalm writer says that God, that God will keep us from harm. There's no promise that we will not experience what it means to be human. There's no promise that we will not have pain, loss, discomfort, that our bodies will sometimes be broken or changed, that we will experience a diagnosis, growth, the growth of being human from an infant to a child, to a teenager, to an, a young adult, to an older person, to our elders who are leaving this world even now, like my grandmother at the age of 96. Our whole life is about transformation and change, and with it comes discomfort and not fitting in your skin or not being, you're being the round peg in the square hole or the square peg in the round hole, whatever you are. We are not protected from bumping up against life itself. That's not how God loves us. God loves us by living into our lives with us. And God kept showing up all through the Hebrew scriptures and asking to be in covenant and in relationship with God's people. And God's people kept getting it wrong, thinking that as soon as they were comfortable, they didn't need God anymore. They didn't need their regular spiritual discipline and their prayers. Or sometimes when they were the most scared, they got it wrong. As soon as they felt God was absent and they couldn't see or prove God's existence, they turned to making idols and worshiping something else and forgetting all the promises that were made to them and that they had made in turn. And so part of the premise of our faith is that God loved us so much that God decided to get as uncomfortable as we are that God decided to have this other part of God's self, Christ, who grew up and had to learn lessons, didn't know everything when he was a baby either, messed up when he was a child and probably had acne when he was a teenager and maybe had a crush on a girl and was awkward. Who knows? We don't know. Those stories aren't told. But what we do know is how much we have heard about how Christ lived among those who were not comfortable in their lives, those who followed him even when they were hungry, those who were desperate to be seen, those who needed to have something healed, whether it was injustice in their lives, economic injustice, or marginalization because they were people who were considered not to have authority or an important voice and people who just needed him to heal their bodies or their minds or their hearts. He chose to walk not among the most comfortable people, but among the most uncomfortable people, the most dispossessed, discomforting people. Even some of the people of power that he made friends with were not welcome in their societies. And his whole life is not a promise that this is going to be easy or painless or that when God will protect you from harm, it means that you will have no harm happen or that you get to skip past suffering. 
It doesn't mean that our human suffering is set as a trial for us or that we're passing some test in order to be worthy of God's love either. Our friend Kevin doesn't have mental health challenges because it was set as a test for him and my child didn't have cancer because it was set as a test for her and those that we love who have illnesses that take them from us or that change them forever. These aren't tests that God sets for us. This is what it means to live in a world that has rough edges and is not perfect and is not easy. And so when God shows up as love, God shows up in whatever might heal us or connect us or simply bear witness to our stories when we can't change anything else about what is about to happen or is happening now. And so when we hear this cluster of stories about a centurion who comes and tells Jesus, could you could you heal this person who's so important to me and speaks out for someone that he cares about and other members of the community come and speak up for the centurion and they advocate for him and then he advocates for the servant that he cares about and he asks for healing. And it is given to him, even though Christ never touches the person that they all advocated for. There was no way that no matter how many people spoke up for that man, that he somehow earned the healing. Just as when things don't go the way we hope or our prayers aren't answered the way we wanted, we somehow got it wrong, didn't do enough or failed a test, and so we're being punished for it. But Christ heard the story and the first part of healing again. As Desmond Tutu told us, and as I mentioned last week, the first part of healing yourself or even a community is to share a story. Whole trials were set up, reconciliation commissions for nations that were torn apart by genocide, by one group of people annihilating another even if some of them were related or best friends all through their lives, and yet those nations have found ways to continue on living in community with each other. And part of how they found a way to get kinship again, to find community again, and it isn't easy. It doesn't mean that everybody suddenly trusts each other or forgives all the harm that has been done. But it began by hearing the story, telling the story, just as the people from that community went to Christ and said, this man's going to come to you and you really need to help him. And then the centurion came and spoke on behalf of the servant. Part of the healing was to hear each other's stories and to see each person as worthy of listening to and recognizing. I know this is a theme that you hear from me a lot, but healing in a relational way begins so much by hearing each other's stories. This week I took an unexpected journey and it was a journey not just across multiple states, driving for two days with my daughter together with my family to say farewell to the woman who taught me that women could be powerful in their faith in every generation, no matter how they chose to serve. My grandmother served as an elder in, church, in her church. My grandfather was a, a minor, and the marriage was a second marriage for either, both of them, and yet she was the only grandmother I ever knew. My grandfather, who worked in the mines until he retired and who died later of that black lung that comes from the coal dust, did not have a college degree, but was a man of great intellect. And he and my grandmother committed to a three-year course of study so that they could become teachers in their church. And my grandfather was so proud of it, and so was my grandmother. They were teachers and educators. They were stewards of their church. 
And as I learned from my mother, when we went to that church to hold that memorial service, six generations of my family have grown up in that Presbyterian church in the mountains of Pennsylvania. My mother sat in the pews of the same church and colored with her grandmother when she was five years old. It was a journey across time. It was a journey between generations. And our family has scattered across the United States since those generations sat in those pews and served in that little mountain church. We were raised largely in Ohio. Two of my siblings still live there in different parts of Ohio, as does my mother, but my one brother lives in Florida and has lived all over the world. And you know that I live here in New England and have lived more of my life here than I did in Ohio. And so when we drove for two days, my brother from Florida bringing two generations of his family with him, my daughter sitting next to me in my car, my sister bringing her daughters and her grandchildren, her four grandchildren, and my brother coming with them. We brought all of our stories and our memories and our feelings and our emotions. And part of what happened this week is that for one precious night, one uneasy, uncomfortable truth telling, we're not done with this night. We sat down at a table and the four siblings talked about what each of us had as memories of our own parents, our birth father, my living mother, and our grandparents. We had not sat in a room together in over four decades. I visited some of my siblings at different times, but four of us all together in the same room hadn't happened for most of our lives. And of course, we only began to tell stories. We didn't finish telling stories. But what was amazing to me is that those storytelling moments were paused. And one sibling said, of course, there's tension here. There's tension in our relationship. We have so much that we haven't talked about. There's so much pain that comes with being together in a room. And another sibling saying, I'm here to listen. We're not done telling our stories. We're not done listening. The path to healing, the path that might lead to forgiveness or reconciliation is a long one. And different people get to different places on that healing journey. The map is different for everyone. The path is different for every person. And yet it begins by sitting down at a table or approaching someone you don't even know and begging them to heal someone you love and telling their story, praying that someone will turn to you and see you and believe that you are worthy of hearing and listening and being curious. And if you are the Christ saying your faith has moved me, return to the one that you care about, that one is healed. Or seeing the pain of someone and simply acknowledging that pain and if they can do something as Christ could for the widow, raising the one that she so desperately mourned, a precursor to what he would do for Lazarus and what he himself would do for all of us. You don't have to forgive everybody. Forgiveness looks like different things for different people. Forgiveness, again, is a letting go of the power that people who have harmed you have over you. When you no longer carry the anger, the resentment, the fear that has been inflicted on you, when you hand that back to the people that gave it to you and imposed it upon you, you are giving yourself freedom and space to grow and to fill what was harmful with something that can be better, gentler, and more compassionate for yourself. And perhaps, 
Perhaps there will be reconciliation across the relationship, but it doesn't always happen. It can't always happen. And yet the promise of a love that will walk into this messy, crazy, painful world that we live in, this amazing, exciting, beautiful world that we want to be part of, is the promise that love won't leave us alone and love will show up in weird, crazy ways and it won't get rid of all the pain. In fact, maybe it will simply bear the pain with us and sometimes even for us because we will say goodbye to people that we love and people that we thought we could trust will hurt us. And sometimes we will have to let go of things we did not want to let go of, even parts of ourselves. And sometimes, Sometimes things are irreversible, and we simply bear witness to the worth of a life, the measure of a full life, all that it could be or should be, and we mourn it in its living and its passing. And in all of those places, love insists on being with us, insists on being part of the messy, healing, resilient, compassionate presence that we will discover. Psalm 121's promise is a little hard to understand, but let us hear it as the promise that God will hold our lives. From the moment that we arrive and take our first breath, until the moment that we leave and draw our last breath and return into a flood of light and love that reminds us, that shows us in a way that we can't even know on this mortal plane what it means to be whole and fully connected. But here we have glimpses of it. And this love will hold us from this moment of arrival to that moment of departure and homecoming, and it will walk with us or wheel in a wheelchair with us one way or another however we get there it will accompany us and find us again and again and hold us and hold us and hold us even when we don't want to be held even when we don't know that we need to be held that love will seek us out and it won't take away all the messiness, but it will bear the messiness with us. For now, let us remember that part of healing is to hear each other's stories, to let other people tell us their stories, no matter how simple or trivial or daily they may seem. To see the worth of another life. And perhaps to share your story with someone who longs to be connected to you. And to know that together, each and every one of us is part of a holy story that travels further back in time and rolls and unfolds forward in time to places and generations we cannot imagine and crosses distances that are beyond our comprehension. And yet we are part of that story during our lifespan and beyond. We are part of a holy story, a healing story, a loving story. Thanks be to God. This week, I simply remind you, as we so often do about offerings, your faithful giving has helped this church be part of the healing of our part of the world and other parts of the world, even through COVID. And it is the contribution you make, no matter how small or how large, with your time, your presence, your financial giving, your covenant, your pledge 
that woven together creates the community that becomes part of a larger community that is indeed the body of Christ and the presence of God's love in this world. And so we thank you for your contributions. I'm just going to check in. Sandy, can you hear me still? Yes. Okay, good. We keep losing the camera, but as long as you guys can hear us, that's wonderful. We're going to turn now to song 401, which is Amazing Grace in the Red Hymnal, or if you are on Zoom, you should find the um, lyrics up on the screen. We're going to sing all, there's four verses on my screen, so I guess we're doing four verses. Do you have four verses in the hymnal? Five. All right, we're going to do Amazing Grace. The next one's Twas Grace. The last one is Through Many Dangers, and the last one is my God has promised good to me. Do you see that? All right, we're going to sing those four verses. Okay, so please rise if you're able. I said there's a lot of inconsistencies in the bulletin this week because yeah I I spent most of the week driving as opposed to reading my stuff again so let's uh turn now to our benediction songs you can stay standing the benediction lyrics are in your bulletin or they'll be on the screen whichever um works for you <laughs>
brothers and sisters, go in the peace of the love that holds your life from your going out to your coming in and every day in between now and forevermore. Go in peace.